moments of joy as history is made. Tonight, the Senate voted to confirm Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson to become the first black woman to ever sit on the Supreme Court. This video posted by the White House captures Judge Jackson and President Biden watching the confirmation as it goes through, the two sharing a hug as the president fulfills a campaign promise. A historic vote from the U.N. tonight to suspend Russia from the Human Rights Council as outrage over war atrocities grow. The horrific and heartbreaking stories coming in from Ukraine that continue to shock the world. Deadly shooting in Israel in a popular area filled with bars and restaurants. The fourth attack in two weeks, stoking fears and setting off a major manhunt. Shocking Secret Service scandal. Two men accused of not just posing as Homeland Security agents, but of showering Secret Service members with extravagant gifts. Why did they do this and who put up the money? What the FBI has uncovered so far. Living as a long hauler. One man's battle with COVID stretches for months. How he's dealing with symptoms that never went away. And how long do those symptoms last? Well, I'm still not completely clear of them. Medical gaslighting, it's a term to describe a problem long felt in healthcare. Patients who feel their doctors dismiss their concerns. The new studies that show women and people of color are impacted most, the results are devastating. No life left behind, from cats to dogs to guinea pigs. The all out effort to help four legged family members escape the war in Ukraine and reunite with their loved ones. During the war times, uh, to be a human, it means uh, to rescue all the living uh, creatures. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the shattering of a glass ceiling on our nation's highest court. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson kickstarted her career as a public defender. Tonight, she has made history as she prepares to become the first black female Supreme Court justice. Judge Jackson watched the historic 53 to 47 vote come in at the White House with President Biden. The two shared a hug as it became official. Since its inception, 233 year history, the Supreme the Supreme Court has had 115 justices, 112 of them have been white, just five of them women. For many, Judge Jackson's mere presence is a major shakeup, though it will not change the balance of the conservative majority. While justice is based on law, it is often informed by our perspectives, and Judge Jackson will soon bring her own lived experience to work inside a building that's considered a pillar of our democracy. Vice President Kamala Harris, who's made some history in her own right, presided over the vote, calling it a glorious day. Congressional correspondent Rachel Scott leads us off tonight from Washington. Tonight, a moment 233 years in the making. On this vote, the yeas are 53, the nays are 47, and this nomination is confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> Judge Katanji Brown Jackson cementing her place in history. Cheers ringing out in the chamber, senators wiping away tears, members of the Congressional Black Caucus crowding in the back. Republicans quickly filed out, walking past Mitt Romney of Utah as he stood applauding. Romney, along with Susan Collins of Maine and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, the only Republican senators to vote yes. At the White House, President Biden and Judge Jackson watched together, hand in hand, the president tweeting this video. All right. <laughs> okay. Wow. The nation's first black and Asian American vice president ecstatic after presiding over the occasion. Madam Vice President, could you tell us how you're feeling today about this historic vote? I'm, it's, I'm um, overjoyed, deeply moved. When the 51-year-old Jackson joins the court for the first time in history, Four of the nine justices will be women, and white men will be in the minority. Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia speaking to the meaning of the moment. I'm the father of a young black girl. I know how much it means for Judge Jackson to have navigated the double jeopardy of racism and sexism to now stand in the glory of this moment in all of her excellence. And tonight, former First Lady Michelle Obama tweeting, I can't help but feel a sense of pride, a sense of joy, to know that this deserving, accomplished black woman will be part of the highest court in the land. 
Michelle Obama, another Harvard graduate student. Rachel Scott joins us now. And Rachel, Justice Breyer, who Judge Jackson clerked for, he's going to stay through the end of this term. So when will she be sworn in? Yeah, so she won't be sworn in for a few more months here. And until then, she will continue to serve as a judge on the D.C. Circuit. But she will be recusing herself from all cases. So the next case that she will likely see or hear will be as a Supreme Court justice, Lindsay. All right, quite a day. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. And we turn now to the war in Ukraine after the horrors revealed in Bucha and other Ukrainian towns. There were new moves today to isolate Russia as the United Nations took the historic step to suspend Russia from its Human Rights Council. It comes as officials in eastern Ukraine are warning people to leave ahead of an expected large-scale invasion by Russia. And Ukraine calls for more aid and weapons from the West. Here's ABC's James Longman reporting once again from Ukraine. Tonight, as Russia is voted off the UN's Human Rights Council, new horrifying scenes like these show why. This apartment block in Bucha took a direct hit. Bodan wants to show us what it did to his friend on the eighth floor. I mean, look, it's completely destroyed in here. And that is the remains of his friend, his charred remains. I mean, I'm looking at his, at his bones, at his, at his body here, just lying on the floor. I want the whole world to know the truth about what's happening here, Bodan says. I only blame the Russian military for this. Every street has a story. Sir, he is standing just feet from where his brother Dima died, shot, he says, by Russian troops. They enforced a curfew between 5 p.m. and 9 a.m., he says. Dima went out for a cigarette, so they killed him. He takes us down to the basement, where his neighbors all took shelter. Just imagine the, the, the horror this man has lived through, and he's kind of apologetic for the state of, of this cellar, but this is where they had to live. The building's residents, some 20 people, lived here, forced below ground for a month because of the Russian occupation. The conditions subhuman. Hello. He takes us to meet his mother, Maria. Every mention of her dead son makes her cry. We had to collect his body. How can you bear it, survive it, she says. She wants to show us pictures of him. You know, these people had lives, they had families, they had happiness. And uh, these are the memories of that. I think this woman's life is now never going to be the same. But how to stop all this? NATO members met in Brussels today to discuss more arms for Ukraine and penalties for Russia. The sickening images and accounts coming out of Bucha and other parts of Ukraine have only strengthened our collective resolve and unity. <laughs> European nations approved new Russian sanctions, including an embargo on coal imports. But Ukraine's foreign minister said more was needed. My agenda is very simple. It has only three items on it. It's weapons, weapons, and weapons. To speed up the delivery of military equipment, the U.S. Senate voted to reinstall the Lend-Lease program. That's the first time it's been used since the Second World War. It gives President Biden more authority to provide Ukraine with weapons basically free of charge, delaying any payment until later, although the House must still pass the bill. Back in Bucha, Serhii takes us to his brother's grave. He had to dig it himself. In Ukraine, candy is traditionally left to allow the dead a sweeter passing. This is all they had for Dima. Just when we think that your stories could not become more heart-wrenching, you show us yet another layer to all of this. James Longman joins us tonight once again from Kiev. And James, uh, Russia was voted off the UN Human Rights Council today for its atrocities during this war. And now we're hearing that Germany may have radio intercepts with some incriminating evidence. Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. Germany's foreign intelligence agency has apparently intercepted messages in which Russian forces are discussing indiscriminate killings of civilians in Bucha. One of them uh, apparently is over the killings of uh, a civilian riding their bike. You may remember those images uh, became infamous, uh, and apparently some of the intercepts are over that particular killing. And, and they seem to show that these are not just the acts of... Uh, you know, bored troops committing kind of random acts of violence, but very much the routine of Russia at war. Lindsay? And you've also been speaking to officials from Human Rights Watch investigating there. What are they telling you? Yeah, I was on the ground here with a researcher from Human Rights Watch, and, and it was fascinating because what they're doing is trying to collect the evidence, trying to go to people's homes to, to, to show them that what they've lived through will one day end up going through a court of law. One day they could get justice. But it's so hard. It's a crime scene, what we're looking at when we walk through these towns. 
in a war zone. Collecting evidence is very, very difficult. I mean, they've buried their friends, their families in their gardens. Uh, those places need to be protected. They are now forensic crime scenes. They need to be properly combed over. We looked around the gardens of, you may remember Mikolo that we met earlier this week, his uh, yard where there were bullets in the wall. These bullets need to be retrieved. The evidence needs to be gathered from witnesses. There is so much to do. But, Lindsay, as you walk through these towns, there is a story around every corner and there is a grave almost around every corner. There is an enormous amount of work to do in this country. Lindsay. All right, James Longman, our thanks to you. Joining us now to discuss Europe's ongoing response to the war in Ukraine is the European Union ambassador to the U.S., Stavros Lambridis. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, today, the EU voted, as you know, to ban Russian coal imports, but delayed the start until mid-August. Why the delay? Because many of our member states are using coal as we speak, and you need uh, a very short phase-out period to ensure that they can replace it. And while the coal ban is significant, Russian oil and gas remain a much larger portion of Europe's energy imports. What will it take for Europe to wean itself off of Russian energy altogether? Well, we're doing this already, and thank you for asking this question. Indeed, uh, many people don't know that about 40 percent of our consumption today of gas comes from Russia, about 30 percent of oil from Russia. Uh, and, uh, and Russia's war in Ukraine and Putin's war in Ukraine uh, has uh, convinced us that we have to um, uh, decouple our energy consumption from Russia entirely. This is going to be a huge hit uh, on the Russian economy. Um, but, uh, of course, uh, it uh, takes immediate steps and uh, medium-term steps. So immediately we have uh, uh, already set a goal of decoupling from Russia two-thirds of what we import today by the end of this year. Uh, and uh, by 2027, to have replaced entirely what we get from Russia now from other sources, including the United States, uh, about one third of, uh, of what we're consuming today from Russia will be coming from the U.S. Uh, in the next years, as agreed by President Biden and President von der Leyen, uh, including by, the, uh, uh, by upfronting uh, a massive investments in renewable energy. As you know, the European Union and its member states are at the front lines of this. And including, of course, looking at um, energy efficiency. I want to underline this for everyone uh, listening. You know, sometimes it doesn't take much uh, for each one of us to make a difference. You drive your car um, at lower speeds uh, on a European road. You turn the light off. We've talked about this for years and years, but this now is a national security crisis for Europe. And uh, you will see massive reductions of energy consumption also because people will start doing those small, sensible things. I think it's safe to say that the masses have been just horrified by the reports and images coming out of Bucha this week. And today we learned that Germany intercepted radio traffic in which the Russian military discusses killing civilians. What's the EU going to do now to investigate these possible war crimes? Look, Lizzie, thanks for asking this, because it's, uh, we, we, we all saw the, 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 uh, the pictures from, uh, from Bucha. Uh, and when I first saw them, uh, I'll be very honest with you. I, I, I looked at them and I thought, this does not look like a battlefield. It looks like a crime scene. Right. I saw single individuals next to their bicycles, uh, others uh, just killed in the middle of the road, um, thrown in there, left in there like garbage by, by the Russian army. Um, these are war crimes. And we are making every effort possible now as Europeans to support the Ukrainians, to support the International Criminal Court that has opened an investigation. The, uh, the uh, OECD, with its own observers, is doing the same, to document those crimes, because those who committed them uh, will be held accountable. And until they are, the rest of the world will know, has to know, the human toll of Putin's brutality. And this is going to be uh, internationally debilitating to him. I certainly believe so. And you saw today at the United Nations, uh, Russia was expelled. Uh, by a two-thirds vote of, of, the, of, of the membership from the Human Rights Council. Uh, Mr. Putin miscalculated in many things, but if he thought he would make himself or he would make his country more respected somehow uh, by uh, indicating strength through brutality, boy, oh boy, did he miscalculate on that. 
And I want to turn now to the growing tide of refugees entering neighboring countries. Now, the U.N. estimates that more than 4.3 million people have fled Ukraine so far. More than half of them have sought refuge in Poland, with officials in eastern Ukraine alerting residents to evacuate immediately. The number of refugees is only likely to increase. What's the EU doing to support Poland and other countries as they try to handle this humanitarian crisis? Well, the EU has approved already the use of close to $18 billion uh, for our member states to be able to use uh, to shelter these people, to allow them to go to school, to offer health care to them, all those things, and jobs, of course. Uh, and uh, in the end of the day, though, what I very frequently think when I see interviews of young girls or boys going to a school uh, somewhere in Italy or in Poland or in anywhere, uh, and they say, boy, we found here, you know, our second home. We know we're protected. Thank you. Thank you, Europe. What I'm thinking is none of these kids, none of these kids asked to be in Europe, going to a school where they don't speak the country, uh, uprooted from their own school, their own friends. This is on Mr. Putin. He sent them there. And we are committed as Europeans to protect them as long as they're in Europe, but hopefully to have them return back home to a uh, independent uh, and uh, and uh, not blood ridden Ukraine. Right, because as you say, no one wanted this war. European Union ambassador to the U.S. Davros Lambrindis, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Next tonight, new details from that shocking Secret Service scandal. Two men arrested, accused of posing as Homeland Security officials and giving lavish gifts to Secret Service agents, including one who worked on the First Lady security team. Tonight, there are many questions about what their motive was and who funded their operation. Chief Global Affairs anchor Martha Raddatz reports. Tonight, growing national security concerns after the arrest of two men for allegedly impersonating federal Homeland Security agents and the suspension of four Secret Service agents after accusations they accepted extravagant gifts and housing from the men, including an agent assigned to protect the first family. Investigators say a Rion to Herzada and Haydar Ali operated out of this D.C. apartment building where FBI agents were seen gathering evidence. Federal prosecutors today reporting a search of their residences and cars uncovered weapons, ammunition, body armor, gas masks, a drone, and a binder with a list of every resident in the apartment complex. The government says Haider Ali claimed to have a connection to the ISI, the Pakistani Intelligence Service, and that agents found visas showing a history of travel to Pakistan and Iran. Today, residents from that building shake it. It's scary, like, you know, it's our place of living. I just came home and then they're just FBI agents. I'm like, what's going on? For more than two years, the men allegedly lavished the Secret Service agents with expensive gifts like free apartments worth $3,000 a month, iPhones, a flat screen TV, surveillance systems, and a drone. To Herzada is accused of offering to buy a $2,000 assault rifle for a member of the First Lady's protective detail. Our Mary Bruce today pressing the White House. A service agent from the First Lady's detail was placed on administrative leave after they associated with it and were provided gifts from two men who were pretending to be Homeland Security Investigations agents. Uh, is the First Lady aware of this? The President aware of this? How concerned are they? I don't have any comment from here. I'd point you to uh, the Secret Service um, and others investigating. So just, do you have any further guidance on what these two men were after or who they may have been working it's with? It's being investigated, and I would point you to the uh, proper agencies. The suspects allegedly posed as special police agents from the DHS investigating January 6th and were equipped with tactical gear, official-looking badges, and weapons. What's more concerning to me is where did these individuals obtain all this gear, identification, um, where did they get all this stuff to be able to create this false persona? So much reason for concern with this regard to this story. Martha Raddatz joins us now. And Martha, prosecutors say that these men were able to dupe federal agents. What do we know about their funding or motive? 
You, you know, Lindsay, that's really the big mystery. This was clearly well-funded, despite the fact the men said they couldn't afford an attorney. One saying today he had no money. So we don't know yet whether someone else or some other country was behind this, nor do we really know what they may have been after, Lindsay. And Martha, this is just really such a, a chilling case, and there's still so much, as you say, that we don't know. Are there concerns tonight that this might have been part of a larger plot? I, I, there are definitely concerns about that. And, and what we do know is even though they've been up to this allegedly for the past two years, the investigation really now is just beginning, Lindsay. All right, Martha Raditz, our thanks to you. Now tonight with COVID cases on the rise in half of the country, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has tested positive for COVID-19. Her office says the 82-year-old who is second in line for the presidency has been double boosted and is asymptomatic. Senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce joins us now. Uh, Mary, there are questions about the president tonight because they have been together twice in the past few days. They have. They attended two events together here at the White House. In fact, Speaker Pelosi at one point at both of the events was standing right next to the president, right over his shoulder. They even exchanged a kiss on the cheek at one point. Now, despite all of that, the White House insists President Biden is not considered a close contact based on the latest CDC guidelines, which is that you have to be within close contact, within six feet of each other for at least uh, 15 minutes or more. They say that is not the instance here. The president was again tested overnight. He was again negative. And the White House says that he will continue to be tested on a regular basis. But the White House is walking a bit of a fine line here. On one hand, the president has been attending a lot of packed, maskless events. We now see him talking to people in crowded rooms quite often. They're trying to use him as an example to show that the country is entering this new phase of the pandemic. But they have to balance that with the fact that Biden is the president of the United States. He is 79 years old. And the White House says they are taking some additional precautions to ensure his safety, like making sure that anyone who comes in direct contact with the president has been tested beforehand. Lindsay. And Mary, another event in Washington, the Gridiron Dinner Saturday night. It seems that that's turning into a bit of a super spreader event. Yeah, it certainly is. Look, look, Pelosi is just one of several uh, A-list, high-profile Washington officials who now has tested positive. That includes two cabinet secretaries, uh, the Commerce Secretary, the Attorney General. They were both at this dinner. Many members of Congress, including Adam Schiff, Joaquin Castro, they were both there as well. Uh, and the Vice President's Communications Director, he is also tested positive, meaning the Vice President is considered to have had a close contact. The Gridiron Dinner is this uh, exclusive Washington club this dinner with, with more than 600 guests, mostly maskless, was intended to be a sign that Washington uh, is returning to normal. Instead, it is now a glaring example that this pandemic is still very real. Lindsay. All right, Mary Bruce reporting in from the White House for us. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. An urgent manhunt is now underway in Israel tonight after a deadly shooting in downtown Tel Aviv that killed at least two and wounded several more. It comes after several recent attacks by Palestinian assailants that have left 11 people dead. Here's ABC's Will Reeve. Tonight, a manhunt in Tel Aviv as Israeli police search for the shooter who opened fire on a bustling downtown street, killing at least two. Police and emergency crews seen racing to popular Dizengoff Street. At least seven others transported to hospitals, some with gunshot wounds. Dizengoff, the cultural heartbeat of Tel Aviv, with bars and restaurants typically buzzing at the time of the shooting. Tonight, police releasing this image of a person of interest. Israeli TV showing one victim receiving help after the shooting amid broken glass and scattered chairs, as authorities urged residents to stay inside and away from their windows. The shooting now the latest in a rash of deadly violence in Israel. At least 11 killed in targeted attacks in over two weeks. Lindsay, U.S. officials are hearing from their Israeli counterparts that over 1,000 security and military personnel are searching for the suspect. The motive is not yet clear, but tonight the Israeli prime minister called it a terrorist attack. Lindsay. Will, thank you. And when we come back, Boy Scouts versus Girl Scouts and a major legal victory for one of them tonight will explain. The mistake for one woman that resulted in $10 million, but up next, the critical research behind, that's being done to look into long COVID and how to help the people across the country suffering from what in some instances can be debilitating symptoms.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Conrad, I love you so much. We should be like Romeo and Juliet at the end. Ha ha, I'd love to be your Juliet. But do you know what happens at the end? It's okay to be scared, and it's normal. I mean, you're about to die. That was the last time anyone in his family saw him alive. Can words kill? How did you even wrap your mind around that? You can't see my whole family crumble. Now, see the true story that inspired the Hulu limited series, the new 2020 Friday night on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck, and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently, and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. This is one lucky dog right here. Animal control officers were called in after Bo went missing near a storm drain. They then found him and with the help of search and rescue were able to pull him to safety. In the end, Bo was totally fine, even posed for a picture. Next tonight, for hundreds of thousands of Americans, now more than two years into this pandemic, their fight with COVID-19 continues. They are the so-called long haulers, but as doctors learn more about the virus, there are also more tools to help those still battling the effects of COVID. Ike Jachi went to a state-of-the-art clinic helping those dealing with post-COVID symptoms. And in the case of a Broadway composer, it's given him another shot to do the job he loves. The sights and sounds of New York City couldn't be brighter or louder than the scenes you'll see on Broadway. Just take Joel Fram's word for it. Conducting is such an amazing experience. Company, company, company. For almost 30 years, on any given night, there's a good chance you'll find him leading a full orchestra for some of the biggest plays on Broadway. I've worked on Cats, I've worked on Wicked, I'm currently conducting Company. What is wrong? You have to almost be psychically connected to everything around you, to the performances that are going on stage, to how people are doing their songs. Not a lot of people realize how much work actually goes into conducting. Uh, what's a typical day for you? You get to the point where it reaches the stage and then you get really long hours. Someone is asking you to create, problem solve, make art for 12 straight hours. 
And in a way, it's exhausting, but also in a way, it's in incredibly rewarding. Joel was living his dream, but like so many other stories across the country, it was interrupted. What happened March 2020? On a Wednesday, I remember at dinner feeling kind of chilled, thinking, is it, is it cold in here? On the Thursday, I woke up and I had such a high fever and felt so sick. Broadway was shut down and so was Joel, putting his return to the orchestra pit in jeopardy. He tested positive for COVID-19 and was experiencing severe symptoms. But after a few weeks, Joel recovered. Back to normal. Back to as normal as it could be, knowing that we were locked down and that there was no job to go to. Just one month later, after feeling fine, his symptoms returned in the most unimaginable way. Not only did I have fatigue, but I had terrible joint pain, which for a conductor is a very, and a pianist is a very terrifying thing. I started to get ocular migraines, so I would have this ring of pain around my left eye that would just be really debilitating. And how long do those symptoms last? Well, I'm still not completely clear of them. Joel was experiencing the beginning of his battle with long COVID, what's now known as post-acute COVID-19 syndrome, clinical symptoms that occur four weeks after initial COVID symptoms. While the numbers have varied, studies indicate that up to 30% of COVID-19 patients experience symptoms up to nine months after recovering. Heart rate looks good, oxygen looks good. New York City's Mount Sinai Hospital has transformed part of its research center into the Center for Post-COVID Care. It's now been open for nearly two years. Dr. Jenna Tosto Mancuso has been working with Joel since the onset of his symptoms. We are at six minutes, so let's take a minute here and work on your breathing. And you can slow your legs if it's going past that two out of town on the exertion scale. And like at Mount Sinai, health experts from around the globe continue to uncover more about this disease. This is still a really, really mysterious condition. It really does affect every single organ system. Dr. Susan Cheng is one of the leading researchers studying post-COVID and says you can experience a range of symptoms. Right now, experts have linked more than 200 different symptoms to the condition. For some people, it is mainly pulmonary uh, or chest pain. In other patients, it's very much neurological or neurocognitive. And in other patients, uh, it's more GI. Dr. Cheng says doctors are still studying post-acute COVID-19 syndrome with little known options for treatment, often affecting patients' daily lives. In the patients that have enrolled into some of our studies, we'd say probably up to half have been able to return to work. A quarter have been able to return to only part-time work and a quarter haven't been able to return to any work. And that's months and months later. Where are we exertion-wise? So I feel like this is about a three. Okay. And the painstaking work goes on at Mount Sinai with thousands of post-COVID patients like Joel, now two years into this pandemic and trying to get their lives back to normal again. It's both a mental and physical process. It's like you're teaching his heart how to work again, right? Teaching his body how to work again, which is really the most unique process. But what we've really come to realize is that a patient-centered approach that progressively introduces activity back into day-to-day -day life, that really targets energy conservation strategies with the goal of slowly but surely rebuilding, I think that in and of itself is the, the bread and butter of, of our rehab program. At the beginning, I was insane. I thought, this isn't working but I just focused on breathing and lowering my heart rate. Dr. Tosto Mancuso says the best way to treat post-COVID is gradually increasing a patient's tolerance for exercise, all while mindful of the possibility that symptoms could return and flare up. For Joel, what started as simple exercises lying down eventually led to minutes on the stationary bike. There is still more to go. You know, I am still, for instance, at the gym at the eight minute, two minute, eight minute stage. But eventually I want to be at the 25 minute stage where you work out in a way that is expected of most people and not flare my symptoms. It took months, but it worked. When Broadway opened back up later that fall, Joel was right in the center of it doing what he loved. I did go back to work in October, and I did work eight-hour rehearsal days, and then 12-hour rehearsal days, and then 16-hour rehearsal days. And 
I happily had the support of my music team, who, if ever I needed to take a moment, could take over for me. But I found that I was able to do my job as long as I managed my energy window. Glad he's back at work, still so mysterious with some of the uh, symptoms that people are experiencing with those long haulers. Our thanks to Ike Ajachi for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the power failure that has left about a million in the dark and sparking new concerns with hurricane season looming in Puerto Rico. Rapper T.I. and his initial anger at one comedian sketch about him and his wife. And we'll take a look at Judge Jackson's historic vote in the Supreme Court overall by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from Major League Baseball. Baseball, it's opening day. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into black markets, you put people to your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. Welcome back, everyone. As we reported, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson shattered the legal world's highest glass ceiling today. So tonight we take a look by the numbers on the historic confirmation and what it means for the Supreme Court's makeup going forward. Of course, Judge Jackson will become the first black woman on the nation's highest court. Of the court's prior 115 justices, 108 have been white men. Judge Jackson will become the sixth woman in the court's 233-year history. Once she's seated, three justices of color will be serving for the first time together, and it will mark the first time four women have been on the bench together as she joins Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, and Coney Barrett. A quick procedural note, there can only be nine Supreme Court justices at a given time, so Judge Jackson will not be called Justice Jackson until Justice Breyer resigns at the end of the term or another vacancy arises. Once she does become Justice Jackson, she will also be the first public defender to ever serve on the Supreme Court. Tonight, the daughter of Martin Luther King Jr. called the confirmation a powerful moment in the history of the nation and a reminder that change can come. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The largest refugee crisis since World War II isn't just about humans. Our in-depth look at what's being done to bring pets from Ukraine to safety. And our conversation with one of the biggest design talk stars. Stay with us, but first, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com.
powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. And this nomination is confirmed. History was made today. The Senate confirming Judge Katanji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court on a bipartisan basis, fulfilling President Biden's promise on the campaign trail to nominate the first black woman to the nation's highest court. President Biden and Judge Jackson watching the vote count from the Roosevelt Room. Vice President Kamala Harris presiding over Judge Jackson's confirmation vote in the Senate. Judge Jackson held one-on-one -on -one meetings with 97 senators on the Hill. She also sat through over 20 hours of questioning during her hearings and filed 330 pages of written responses. That's more written questions than any previous Supreme Court nominee. Republicans tried to paint her as soft on crime. Once Judge Jackson joins the court this fall, she'll be taking on several controversial cases encompassing the death penalty, the Clean Water Act, and the humane treatment of animals in our food supply, to name a few. A victory for the Boy Scouts in their efforts to appear gender neutral while trying to attract girls to their ranks. A federal judge rejecting claims from the Girl Scouts that the Boy Scouts' use of the term scouting without referring to gender was confusing. The formerly all-male Scouts started allowing girls to join in 2017. Old saying goes, I'd rather be lucky than good. Well, luckily for Tarzana's Lakedra Edwards, it turns out she was good with a mistake that led her to winning $10 million in the lottery. After putting $40 into a scratcher's vending machine at a nearby Vons, Edwards was bumped into when she was about to start selecting which game she wanted. Well, the physical impact of the stranger bumping into her caused her to accidentally push the wrong number on the machine, meaning the number she didn't intend to push. But all's well that ends well, because Edwards scratched off the game's top prize of $10 Ooh. Million. Ten million dollars. Utility crews scrambled to restore power across Puerto Rico. The island plunged into darkness after a power station fire. Government officials say a circuit breaker fire at a power plant knocked out electricity to more than 350,000 customers. Authorities closed schools and businesses. Officials are urging people to stay off the roads there. Governor Hochul says New York is prepared to offer assistance to people on the island. 
Rapper T.I. is under fire after video from a comedy club in Atlanta shows him storming the stage and snatching the mic from a comedian, who mentioned the sexual assault allegations he and his wife previously faced, and they both deny. There is nothing to charge me for. In recent years, roughly 30 women have accused the Live Your Life rapper of a litany of crimes, including drugging, kidnapping, rape, and intimidation. The comedian, Lauren Knight, claims that T.I., whose real name is Clifford Harris, was heckling her and yelling for her to take off her wig. She said the taunt is what made her bring up the allegations, which did not go to trial. Knight later said she believed T.I. was innocent. T.I. has since taken to social media to seemingly make amends and wish the comedian well. The first day of jury selection in the worst U.S. mass shooting to go to trial was slow, methodical, and painstaking, a process that's expected to drag on for two months. More than 120 of the first 160 prospective jurors were dismissed from the trial. Most said it would be impossible for them to serve from June through September, the amount of time expected for lawyers to present their cases in a trial that will decide whether Nicholas Cruz gets life in prison or a sentence of death for murdering 17 at Parkland's Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in 2018. One woman was dismissed after saying she couldn't serve on a jury because she needed to meet up with her sugar daddy every day. Welcome back. We've all seen the images, refugees pouring out of Ukraine, carrying their most precious possessions. In many cases, that's man's best friend. Tonight, ABC's Inez de la Quatara got an inside look at the global rescue efforts in Ukraine to save abandoned pets and even exotic zoo animals from the terrors of war. From the small to the ferocious, the largest exodus since World War II isn't just people, it's animals too, escaping bombed out zoos and apartment buildings. More than just pets, they're members of the family, providing refugees comfort and company as they're forced to leave their homes. <laughs> that powerful bond on display as millions of Ukrainians flee with what they value most, man's best friend. At this train station in Chemischel, Poland, we meet Boots and his owner Svetlana. <laughs> becoming emotional as she recounts having to leave her son behind to fight. She says Boots, nestled in her lap, is like family. On social media, over a million followers keep tabs on Ukrainian cat Stepan. His owner details their harrowing escape from Kharkiv to Poland and then to France. Stepan's account now raising funds to help the many animals left behind as Ukrainians are rallying to save some of the country's most helpless beings. This Ukrainian actor going viral running into the burning buildings of Urban, breaking down doors, finding terrified animals, Boy, bringing them to shelters. It was possible. The group Zoo Patrol drilling holes through the walls of apartments, responding to worried calls from families who fled. This man saving over 100 horses with his foundation as veterinarians in neighboring countries work overtime. At a border crossing in Medica, Poland, we find an American, Mike Merrill, from the nonprofit Florida Urgent Rescue, FUR for short, taking his expertise helping animals in natural disasters to the front lines of war. It's your first war zone. In a hurricane or the tornado, when the storm moves through, then the disaster relief can come in. In this case, disaster relief is prevented from coming in. He's already crossed into Ukraine five times, saving at least 50 dogs and working to reunite this little boy with his guinea pig. The problem is, as the fighting increased and the evacuations increased, a lot of people were turned away at the train station or the bus station. They were told, you can't get on the train or the bus with that dog. So they, they were tying up the dogs at the train station. It's even trickier getting wild animals to safety. Sometimes that looks like this, a van full of kangaroos. The Poznan Zoo in Poland stepping in to help evacuate some of the animal kingdom's most fearsome creatures. All the animals are suffering so much during this war and are the innocent victims uh, of this horrible situation. In a modern day Noah's Ark, gingerly evacuating the animal kingdom's most fearsome creatures with breaks for water and snacks. 
Lions and tigers making it to Poland like those pets carried in the arms of Ukraine's refugees. I think that uh, during the war times, uh, to be a human, it means uh, to rescue all the living uh, creatures. Greeted with a friendly smile, a bag of food, and a pat on the head, an acknowledgement. No matter the politics or ideology, that universal love for animals brings out the best in humanity. A modern day Noah's Ark is right. Our thanks to Inez for that. Several factors can contribute to a patient's health care, but studies show that women and people of color are among those who experience unequal access and biases from medical providers. ABC News's Janae Norman covers one nurse who experienced what she calls medical gaslighting. Despite two congenital heart conditions, nurse Jenna Reich loves to run. I was probably usually doing anywhere between like 40 miles a week or so. Yeah. And yeah, that was just, it was just a huge part of my life. So when the 35 year old started to struggle on her jogs, Jenna says she sought help from numerous doctors, several of which she says dismissed her symptoms. I actually had one of the doctors say that for a nurse, I seem to have a really difficult time explaining my symptoms. And I was so insulted by what? that because if there's anything I pride myself in, it's the fact that I can explain my symptoms really, really well. A new doctor who did extensive tests found she needed heart surgery, which Jenna says saved her life. Every run I went on could have quite literally been the thing that ended my life. And that is so scary to think about. Medical gaslighting is the term used by some patients who say their symptoms are inappropriately dismissed as minor or dismissed as psychological. Up to 12 million Americans are estimated to be misdiagnosed every year. Unfortunately, women and people of color are more likely to experience gaslighting from those who are supposed to care for them. And some patients begin to accept this mistreatment as the norm and um, some distrust the healthcare system as a whole and then are less likely to even seek care when they need it. On average, some studies suggest women are less likely to receive the care they need, like less likely to get basic tests for a heart attack. Multiple factors could contribute to differences in health care among people of color, including unequal access to health care and potential biases among medical providers. If someone um, views a patient as of a lower class or that they will not follow up, you know, based on their uh, race, this can then influence what they then do for that patient. They may be less likely to prescribe a certain medication for them or refer them to a specialist. What makes you want to speak out about this now? I feel like it's my purpose to, to do this. If you are a patient and you feel like you're not being heard or you're being disregarded, that you deserve to seek a second opinion. You deserve to get the care that you need. Our thanks to Janae. We turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we interview some of our favorite TikTokers, taking a closer look at the story behind the sensation. A new community is emerging on the platform coined as Design Talk. It teaches users how to elevate their space using DIY hacks. And joining us tonight is someone who knows how to turn old cabinets into a fresh, trendy style. With more than one million followers across all platforms, Drew Scott shows us how to make our homes look like a magazine on a budget through his popular brand, Lone Fox Home. Drew, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. How are you doing? I am good. I can't complain. Certainly could use your help. I really do not have the design gene in me. Uh, I, so I'm so curious, what led you to start utilizing TikTok, a platform typically associated with dance videos, as a tool to showcase your innovative design styles? Yeah, and you know, that, that was something I actually asked myself when I first got on TikTok because I primarily started on YouTube and it was a platform that I used to create long form content, more longer makeovers. They do normally take a bit of time and I would post them on my YouTube channel. But then I decided after downloading TikTok during quarantine and seeing just so many dancing videos and singing videos, I was like, you know, we can just create short form content on this platform and it didn't have to be dancing or singing. And I really felt like it was a space to just for to digest just new information, if that makes sense. It totally makes a lot of sense. And a lot of your content features your artistic DIY projects and at home projects can certainly be difficult to master. Uh, are you always able to nail it each time or, or have you ever actually started a project that then went horribly wrong? 
Oh, I have definitely started projects that have gone wrong before. Um, I remember, well, backtracking a little bit, um, a lot of projects, they just take a little bit of time, but I swear on my channel, I love making projects that require minimal power tools, that kind of require minimal effort, just so it's something that feels attainable to the viewer. But I've had problems gone wrong in the past. I, I did a light fixture a while back, and I actually screwed right through the live wire of the Ooh. light fixture, and it... It wasn't the best, but you know, I learned and now I have a fire extinguisher handy whenever I do that. And you live to tell. Yes. Uh, you, you've had a lot of success in the decor industry. At the start of this year, Architectural Digest debuted your new design series called Custom Craft for AD. Uh, what was that experience like for you? That was very unreal for me because my whole career has kind of been built as a DIY. I really did it all myself. I started posting videos when I was younger. They started to gain some traction. I just, I did really everything myself. I was filming myself, editing myself. And then when AD reached out to work on a project, it just felt like, wow, you know, like what I was doing was the right thing to do. And people actually do enjoy this content. And it just felt like a really big accomplishment for myself. And I was just honored that they wanted to do a video with me. And I think the project turned out amazing, honestly. And you've also helped transform rooms for your friends, celebrities, most recently your parents' kitchen. What would you say your dream collaboration would be? Oh, uh, that is a tricky one. You know, I would just love to do a full home. I've never gotten the opportunity to do an entire house. So somebody that is willing to let me do their entire home from top to bottom is probably a dream collab for me just because a lot of my spaces that I do are rental friendly or small. So I'd love to be able to, to like use my full artistic vision and do like an entire home. And the home decor space, or decor, I guess I should say, it's really blown up in recent years with millennials and Gen Zers caring about their homes, many leaning more toward custom design pieces. Why do you think that is? You know, I feel like um, after being on social media, you always see people that have the same stuff as you. And a lot of times you see these aspirational images on Pinterest or Instagram and you kind of try to recreate them. And then you realize a lot of your spaces are looking like everyone else's spaces. And I feel like DIY is a place where you're able to create something that only you have. It's the thing you created with your own two hands. So it just feels a little bit more legitimate. And at the same time, you can customize it, whether it be colors, whether it be like finishes. And it just overall is a custom piece you made it and a lot of times you can do DIY affordably as well which is nice so uh, you get a little bit more bang for your buck as well and Drew this set of course this is my second home here any any tips or tricks that you, th you think might help make this space a little trendier maybe a plant you know I mean if you just wanted to add maybe a couple plants or something <laughs> I just feel like a little liveliness would be nice couple I, of plants I yeah, agree we'll, plant. we'll have to have you come we could we could definitely use your services Please. in this space and, <laughs> and throughout uh, our our lives so we thank we you can do a DIY <laughs> together yes yes it'll be a dream collaboration 100 percent all right Drew thank you so much for talking with us tonight lots of fun thank you so much for having me and before we go tonight the image of the day Snapshot of history right there. President Biden and Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson share a moment of joy as the U.S. Senate confirms Judge Jackson to become the first black woman to be a justice on the Supreme Court. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. hour more on the monumental day in Washington after the historic Judge Jackson vote. And who are Putin's daughters and why did they get added to the sanctions list? Stay with us. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source.
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele. The guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it, in fact, existed. I said, take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. At least 14 members of Congress and White House officials have tested positive for COVID this week. Some of the cases include House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Representative Angie Craig, who were both phot photographed close to President Biden this week. Senator Susan Collins, who was seen wearing a mask during a confirmation vote for Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, announced her diagnosis today. As of last night, President Biden's daily test was negative. New York's attorney general today asked the court to hold former President Donald Trump in contempt for failing to respond to a subpoena. She also requested a daily $10,000 fine until Trump complies. The subpoena is part of the state's civil investigation into the way that Trump values his real estate portfolio. The deadline was March 31st. The former president released a statement accusing the New York attorney general of using her office for political gain. The NFL discrimination lawsuit originally brought by former Miami Dolphins coach Brian Flores now has two more names attached. Lawyers for Steve Wilkes, formerly of the Arizona Cardinals, and Ray Horton, a longtime assistant to coach and defensive coordinator, say they, like Flores, were not given equal consideration for opportunity for or opportunities for advancement. The NFL declined to comment on the latest accusations. And we begin this hour in Washington with the shattering of a glass ceiling on our nation's highest court. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson kickstarted her career as a public defender. Tonight, she has made history as she prepares to become the first black female Supreme Court justice. Congressional correspondent Rachel Scott reports. Tonight, a moment 233 years in the making. On this vote, the yeas are 53, the nays are 47, and this nomination is confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> Judge Katanji Brown Jackson cementing her place in history. Cheers ringing out in the chamber, senators wiping away tears, members of the Congressional Black Caucus crowding in the back. Republicans quickly filed out, walking past Mitt Romney of Utah as he stood applauding. Romney, along with Susan Collins of Maine and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, the only Republican senators to vote yes. At the White House, President Biden and Judge Jackson watched together hand in hand. The president and tweeting this video. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The nation's first black and Asian American vice president ecstatic after presiding over the occasion. Madam Vice President, could you tell us how you're feeling today about this historic vote? I'm, it's, I'm um, overjoyed, deeply moved. When the 51-year-old Jackson joins the court for the first time in history, four of the nine justices will be women and white men will be in the minority. Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia speaking to the meaning of the moment. I'm the father of a young black girl. I know how much it means for Judge Jackson to have navigated the double jeopardy of racism and sexism to now stand in the glory of this moment in all of her excellence. And tonight, former First Lady Michelle Obama tweeting, 
I can't help but feel a sense of pride, a sense of joy, to know that this deserving, accomplished black woman will be part of the highest court in the land. Quite a monumental moment. Our thanks to Rachel Scott for that. And joining us now for more is the president of the National Bar Association, Judge Carlos Moore. Judge, thanks so much for your time tonight. Thanks for having me. So you are head of the nation's oldest and most extensive network of black American lawyers, judges, law professors, and law students. Here's the moment. Let's take a look when Judge Jackson found out with President Biden that she was going to be the next justice on the Supreme Court. What was going through your mind today when the confirmation became official? Yeah, chills are just going down my spine as a father of a young black girl who's 11 years of age, who now knows that she can go to the highest court in the land. Uh, it's just an amazing day. It's a great day, an unforgettable day. And so as the president of the National Bar Association and this nation's six to 7,000 black lawyers and judges, we were just elated, overwhelmed. And I understand that you've been invited to the White House tomorrow for the ceremony commemorating Judge Jackson's confirmation. If you have an opportunity to talk with her, what will you say? If I have that opportunity, have that opportunity I would just say simply congratulations, job well done. Thanks for being the epitome of the American dream. And Judge Jackson kickstarted her career, as you know, as a public defender, will be the first former public defender on the court. Can you talk about why having that perspective will be so important? Because the nation's highest court, the Supreme Court, speaks time and time again about constitutionality, constitutional issues dealing with uh, the criminal justice system. And we need that viewpoint on the nation's highest court. Heretofore, has been missing. And so we are pleased that someone has, that has represented criminal defendants as a public defender will now be on the nation's highest court. And you shared with us earlier that you have an 11 year old daughter yourself. I'd like to show you a photo now from Judge Jackson's confirmation hearing that many have shared and expressed how it made them emotional. Uh, you can see Judge Jackson's daughter proudly looking on. What goes through your mind when you see this this moment? You know, for so long, uh, black women have had the burden of having a double minority. They have to deal with racism and sexism. We've long known that black men could be on the nation's highest court since Justice Thurgood Marshall, we have known since Barack Obama that a black man could become president of the United States. But now in this time that we're living in, not only can a black woman be vice president of the United States, but she can sit on the Supreme Court. This is just a special time in history and that this is a day that we would never, ever forget. And you say it's a day you would never forget. Did you feel that it was a day that would be far off? Or, or are you surprised it took this long? Or are you saying, oh, wow, I can't believe I lived to see this? It... It's surprising that it took 233 years before we saw this day. Uh, 115 justices and none have ever been a black woman. And so it's surprising, but we're thankful. Dr. King said it best, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It is high time black women saw themselves represented on the nation's highest court, and we could not be more pleased. President of the National Bar Association, Mr. Carlos Johnson, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. We turn now to the war in Ukraine after the horrors revealed in Bucha and other Ukrainian towns. There were new moves today to isolate Russia as the United Nations took the historic step to suspend Russia from its Human Rights Council. It comes as officials in eastern Ukraine are warning people to leave ahead of an expected large-scale invasion by Russia and Ukraine calls for more aid and weapons from the West. Here's ABC's James Longman reporting once again from Ukraine. Tonight, as Russia is voted off the UN's Human Rights Council, new horrifying scenes like these show why. This apartment block in Bucha took a direct hit. Bodan wants to show us what it did to his friend on the eighth floor. I mean, look, it's completely destroyed in here. And that is the remains of his friend, his child remains. I mean, I'm looking at his, at his bones, at his, at his body here, just lying on the floor. I want the whole world to know the truth about what's happening here, Bodan says. I only blame the Russian military for this. Every street has a story. Sir, he is standing just feet from where his brother Dima died, shot, he says, by Russian troops. They enforced a curfew between 5 p.m. and 9 a.m., he says. Dima went out for a cigarette, so they killed him. He takes us down to the basement, where his neighbors all took shelter. Just imagine the, the, the horror this man has lived through, and he's kind of apologetic for the state of, of this cellar, but this is where they had to live. The building's residents, some 20 people, lived here, forced below ground for a month because of the Russian occupation. The conditions subhuman. 
Hello. He takes us to meet his mother, Maria. Every mention of her dead son makes her cry. We had to collect his body. How can you bear it, survive it, she says. She wants to show us pictures of him. You know, these people had lives, they had families, they had happiness. And uh, these are the memories of that. I think this woman's life is now never going to be the same. But how to stop all this? NATO members met in Brussels today to discuss more arms for Ukraine and penalties for Russia. The sickening images and accounts coming out of Bucha and other parts of Ukraine have only strengthened our collective resolve and unity. <laughs> European nations approved new Russian sanctions, including an embargo on coal imports. But Ukraine's foreign minister said more was needed. My agenda is very simple. It has only three items on it. It's weapons, weapons, and weapons. To speed up the delivery of military equipment, the U.S. Senate voted to reinstall the Lend-Lease program. That's the first time it's been used since the Second World War. It gives President Biden more authority to provide Ukraine with weapons basically free of charge, delaying any payment until later, although the House must still pass the bill. Back in Bucha, Serhii takes us to his brother's grave. He had to dig it himself. In Ukraine, candy is traditionally left to allow the dead a sweeter passing. This is all they had for Dima. Our thanks to James for that. And next to a closer look at those new sanctions in Russia, particularly their impact on Vladimir Putin's daughters, Terry Moran with more on who they are and why they were targeted. The walls are closing in on those closest to Russian President Vladimir Putin after the U.S. and the E.U. announced a new round of sanctions, some aimed directly at Putin's adult daughters. Together with our allies and our partners, we're going to keep raising the economic cost and ratchet up the pain for Putin. Maria and Katerina, Putin's children with his ex-wife Ludmila Skribneva, have remained out of the public eye for most of their lives. The U.S. Treasury described their alleged roles and how they're connected to the Kremlin. Maria, 36 years old, is the leader of a state-funded genetics research program that the Kremlin allegedly gives billions of dollars to. Vladimir Putin personally oversees it, according to the Treasury. And Katerina, 35, she's a tech executive whose work supports the Russian government and defense industry, the Treasury alleges. In a rare interview about his family, Putin discussed his daughter's careers in this 2017 docuseries with film director Oliver Stone. You're a very lucky man. Two good children. Yes, I'm proud of them. Katarina is also known for her acrobatic rock and roll competition. Now the women are grown with children of their own. Are you a good grandfather? Do you play with them in the garden? Very seldom. Very seldom. Very little is publicly known about Vladimir Putin's wealth, though independent investigators believe it is vast, several concluding that Putin is a billionaire. He lives like one. His opponents who hope to expose Russian corruption have released images of what is believed to be Putin's $1.4 billion home, known as Putin's Palace, and his $700 million yacht registered under others' names. And that is why the U.S. is targeting those closest to Putin. A White House official saying they believe many of Putin's assets are hidden with family members. The U.S. and the EU are also taking new aim at the oligarchs who support Putin. On Monday, U.S. officials seized a $90 million yacht called Tango, owned by a Russian billionaire accused of having close ties to Putin. Over 600 companies have withdrawn their businesses from Russia so far, some, like Chanel, even refusing to sell products to Russians abroad unless they confirm they won't use those products in Russia. Why do we have to respect Chanel House? Enraged Russian influencers posted videos showing them cutting up their Chanel bags in protest. But for so many ordinary Russians, the effects of sanctions are devastating, especially to those who depend on Western business. We expect hundreds of thousands of people to lose their jobs because of the sanctions and Western companies withdrawing from Russia. Our thanks to Terry. And now more on that bizarre Secret Service scandal. Federal prosecutors charging two men with posing as Homeland Security officials and giving gifts to Secret Service agents, including one who worked with the First Lady's security team. Martha Raddatz has more. 
Tonight, growing national security concerns after the arrest of two men for allegedly impersonating federal homeland security agents and the suspension of four Secret Service agents after accusations they accepted extravagant gifts and housing from the men, including an agent assigned to protect the first family. Investigators say a Rion Herzada and Haydar Ali operated out of this D.C. apartment building where FBI agents were seen gathering evidence. Federal prosecutors today reporting a search of their residences and cars uncovered weapons, ammunition, body armor, gas masks, a drone, and a binder with a list of every resident in the apartment complex. The government says Haider Ali claimed to have a connection to the ISI, the Pakistani Intelligence Service, and that agents found visas showing a history of travel to Pakistan and Iran. Today, residents from that building shake it. It's scary, like, you know, it's our place of living. I just came home and then they're just FBI agents. I'm like, what's going on? For more than two years, the men allegedly lavished the Secret Service agents with expensive gifts like free apartments worth $3,000 a month, iPhones, a flat screen TV, surveillance systems, and a drone. Teherzada is accused of offering to buy a $2,000 assault rifle for a member of the First Lady's protective detail. Our Mary Bruce today pressing the White House. A service agent from the First Lady's detail was placed on administrative leave after they associated with and were provided gifts from two men who were pretending to be Homeland Security Investigations agents. Uh, is the First Lady aware of this? The President aware of this? How concerned are they? I don't have any comment from here. I'd point you to uh, the Secret Service um, and others investigating. So just, do you have any further guidance on what these two men were after or who they may have been working it's with? It's being investigated, and I would point you to the uh, proper agencies. The suspects allegedly posed as special police agents from the DHS investigating January 6th and were equipped with tactical gear, official-looking badges, and weapons. What's more concerning to me is where did these individuals obtain all this gear, identification, um, where did they get all this stuff to be able to create this false persona? Our thanks to Martha. And now let's switch gears and go to Augusta, Georgia, for Tiger Woods' highly anticipated return to the Masters Golf Tournament. The five-time Masters champion teed off this morning in his quest for a sixth green jacket just 13 months after nearly losing his leg in a car crash. So how did Tiger fare today? Here's ABC's Steve Osinsami. Tiger Woods. America loves a comeback, and at the world's most legendary golf tournament in Georgia tonight, the crowds are going wild because Tiger Woods made it onto the leaderboard. After teeing off at Augusta National just after 11 this morning, he's currently one under par at the Masters, setting up a possible miraculous return after this terrible car crash last year where he nearly lost his right leg. He was walking the greens with a slight limp today. He says his biggest challenge is in his golf game, saying this time it's simply walking the hilly fairways of Augusta National. So you got an afternoon tea time tomorrow. What will the next 16, 18 hours look like for you? Uh, lots of ice. <laughs> <laughs> He's won this tournament five times and made history as the first black American to win the green jacket in 1997. And he's still the youngest winner ever. His last victory was in 2019 after getting through both surgeries and scandals. He's a surprise just to be here. And even people who didn't think he had a chance are now saying you can't count him out. Tiger Woods says his plan now is to continue pushing through the day and then using his trainers to help him recover at night. He tees off again Friday afternoon. He's getting a warm welcome on the greens from people watching and from other players. And you can bet that if he is still in the hunt come the end of the weekend, he'll have a lot of people cheering from their living rooms. Lindsay? Yeah, I'm sure he's a fan favorite. Steve, thank you. Still to come, the global outrage after Turkey allows Saudi Arabia to take over the criminal proceedings into journalist Jamal Khashoggi's death and living with autism. Stay with us. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. 
We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The Turkish court ruled today that the trial for murdered Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi can be moved to Saudi Arabia. The prosecutor requested the move after his office was unable to execute arrest warrants or obtain statements from the Saudi suspects. Today, Khashoggi's fiance told reporters that Turkey had given up, but she will continue to struggle for justice. Many observers know that the move to Saudi Arabia could effectively end the case. Khashoggi was a vocal critic of the Saudi leader in his 2018 killing at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul triggered a global outcry. Shanghai is entering a second week of total lockdown and an increasing number of the city's residents say they are running out of food, medicine and other necessities. The city is carrying out mandatory COVID-19 testing for all of its 26 million residents. Today, officials reported nearly 20,000 new cases with less than 2% of those symptomatic. The government has converted a 300,000 square meter exhibition hall into a temporary hospital and deployed thousands of medics from across the country. And in Brazil, indigenous people from hundreds of tribes are demonstrating outside the country's capital this week. They're protesting President Bolsonaro's proposal that would allow mining and oil exploration on tribal lands and open protected land to commercial mining and agriculture. Organizers hope to gather 7,000 people to put pressure on Brazil's Congress to reject the measure. April is Autism Acceptance Month, marking recognition of the de developmental disability that today affects one in 44 American children. So ABC's Michael Strahan brings us this look at what life is like for one man with autism. Eric Garcia is a journalist on Capitol Hill. There are days where I'm here all night and then there are days where, you know, I go home at a reasonable hour. He's also autistic and author of the groundbreaking book, We're Not Broken, Changing the Autism Conversation. Autistic people work in every sector. They're doctors and lawyers and waitresses. They're, 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 they're everywhere. He's one of at least 20 million people worldwide with autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, which affects one in 44 American children. People who know about autism, they can typically guess within a few minutes, but I think a lot of people also, they'll say, oh, you're not like my kid, because uh, my kid can't speak. But like, you know, it just means that autism manifests itself in very different ways. The spectrum is described like a color wheel. Each person uniquely affected by a range of different traits in areas of communication, behavior, and socialization. So someone might have the communication delay, but may not have the motor skill delay. They may experience sounds and lights in a very different way than you and I would. And sometimes they can experience a sensory overload and they may wear headphones and this will help to make the noise not as severe. But also they may avoid certain situations where it's just too overwhelming. Another autistic trait is stemming, making repetitive movements or sounds 
which can calm them when feeling overwhelmed, is something some share on social media. For Eric, that means playing with his tie and ring. A lot of times I can just completely be overwhelmed and almost want to have a meltdown in like to the point where it's difficult for me to communicate, speak. And that's just my way to deal with all the sounds. Experts say early detection and intervention is key. When a child is young, the brain is capable of change. By six months, early signs include little or no smiling and limited eye contact. By 12 months, little or no babbling, pointing, or response to their name. And by 24 months, few or no meaningful two-word phrases. Flapping their hands, spinning, twirling, walking on their toes. If you do see these behaviors in your child, these are behaviors that are associated with ASD and important to mention to your pediatrician. Our thanks to Michael Strahan for that. And still to come, the group of students who just solved a cold case. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was Diva. drama, money and fame, shop amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Investigators in training, a group of students managed to crack a decades-old cold case, and their professor says they're just getting started. Ari Height with our partner station WPBF takes us to the Institute for Cold Case Investigations in tonight's local lowdown. You can see who the witness was that they interviewed. Casey Hatwood is a student at Indian River State College. She also just solved a cold case that had perplexed law enforcement for 34 years. It was really nice giving the family closure. I think that was the most rewarding part of it. Casey didn't solve it by herself. She was one of eight students on the case. Their detective work was all part of a class at the college, the Institute for Cold Case Investigations, founded by Dr. Kimberly Masnick. One, I wanted to give students the hands-on experience of what they have learned in the four years of their education. Here's how this works. The Institute partners with the Indian River County Sheriff's Office, who gives them a cold case. They give us, we have absolutely everything as far as evidence, suspects, this, that. And we're teaming them up with both traditional sworn law enforcement detectives and our forensic uh, crime scene investigators. And then the students go to work. We did absolutely everything on our own. They were here to assist us and answer questions, but we had to do all the research. We had to go through all the evidence. For this class, they looked at the case of Stephen Patterson, a 28-year-old man found burned to death in a car just outside Vero Beach in 1988. It had been ruled a homicide. The students spent more than 100 hours working the case. This is their actual supplement report, so this is what their findings were. And then they found something interesting from the medical examiner. They had a revised death certificate from five years after the case, and the ME actually changed the cause of death to suicide. But that change never made it to the sheriff's office. With this new information, the class was able to close a case that had been pending since 1988. I had never been so proud as a professor in my whole life. In a cold case, it's not unusual, especially one that's decades old, to find things that you didn't, that weren't found early on. 
The next class is now on to the next case, a homicide from 1989. We have a single victim. Okay. Uh, we have multiple suspects. There is a, a shirt that the victim was wearing that had blood on it. And when this one is done, there will always be more waiting. And Dr. Mastic students want their shot at solving all of them. Hopefully they'll have that one solved. Our thanks to Ari Height. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news.